Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Brass 101. Thanks for joining us here this evening. We'll be getting underway here in just a moment, a few administrative announcements to get things going. My name is Tom Kelly, and happy to have you joining us here tonight. If you have not already done so, please download the mobile app Mentimeter. We will be using that tonight for some spot quizzes. Again, that's Mentimeter, and you can get it either uh, from, from your app store, whether you have an iOS device or an Android device. Also, for those of you who would like to get a video copy of tonight's presentation and also past presentations of Brass 101, those will be available in the education section of BrassAvalanche.org and also on the Brass Avalanche Facebook page. To help kick things off tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce one of the founders of Brass. Uh, Cindy Burlack is actually an award-winning uh, volunteer who has been very involved in this Brass 101 program, uh, winning an honor this past year from U.S. Ski and Snowboard. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Cindy Burlack to kick things off tonight. Cindy? Thank you so much, Tom, for all your effort and your skill putting this program together. Steve and Carolyn, Ronnie's sister, and I, as well as the entire Astle family, have a sincere interest in your in teaching you snow safety. In 2015, our Ronnie and Bryce Astle were US ski team athletes on a race trip to Austria. They were taken from us in an avalanche, skiing in lift service terrain in the middle of a ski resort. They just did not have the knowledge that they needed to keep safe and nor did their coaches. In the aftermath of the accidents, we Burlaks and Astles have started Bryce and Ronnie Athlete Snow Safety Foundation. We don't want any other family to go through what we have. So please listen carefully and talk to your buddies about what you learn here. Viewing our webinars this fall, we've had representatives from the avalanche safety community all over the world. We are united in the mission to keep you safe. We're proud tonight to have Scott Shell here to deliver the Brass 101. For 10 years, he's been the executive director of the Friends of the Avalanche Northwest Avalanche Center in Washington State. He's a highly qualified avalanche instructor certified by ARI and a mountain guide. Some of this content is spectacular, but some of it is tough to watch. We hope it grabs your attention. Here's Scott. Awesome, uh, thanks Cindy and uh, thanks Tom for, uh, for running all the tech here tonight. Uh, and thanks to all of you for uh, taking some time out of your evening and uh, getting uh, educated uh, about avalanches because uh, as we're going to see tonight, um, it's important to understand the, uh, you know, the power uh, that these, this phenomena has and uh, what sort of tragedy that it can uh, lead up to. So I uh, appreciate you all taking the time. Um, yeah, and I'm, uh, I'm uh, joining you from, uh, from the Seattle area. We've had a great kickoff to our season this year. We're, we're well over 100% of normal at this point. So uh, several of the ski areas are, are open and uh, many people are getting out in the backcountry. So why don't we begin? But first I just, I wanna mention um, the uh, sponsors uh, to this program. So without the uh, critical support that these organizations provide, it would be hard to uh, produce a program like this. So uh, really quick, uh, this program is, is uh, catered towards ski racers. It doesn't mean you have to be a ski racer to get something out of it, but uh, ski racers uh, uh, present a unique challenge uh, to avalanche educators, uh, mostly because there hasn't been uh, focused education built for ski racers uh, and coaches alike. So that's, that's, you know, the core mission of, of the Brass Foundation uh, is to, you know, build uh, avalanche education uh, for ski racers and coaches uh, and avid, uh, avid skiers and snowboarders alike. So first, I want to start by uh, showing a short film that I think will uh, summarize a lot. So let's get going here. Thank you. 
Starting CPR. One, two, three, four, five, 15, six, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 2, 23, 24, 5, 6, 7, 8. Lift on three. One, two, three. Are you sure there were only two? Yeah, there's two. Just two, just two. Okay, we're going to find him. Charlie! Not breathing, no pulse. Starting CPR. can turn deadly in a matter of seconds. It's hard to believe that such a tragedy could happen. The accident has left many in the skiing world in shock. Tragic news tonight as two elite skiers training for a spot on the U.S. Olympic team are killed in an avalanche. Rescue crews from Solden were on the scene immediately with multiple helicopters. Our thoughts and prayers are with those who are apparently lost in the this uh, specific incident. Who are you? I'm Bryce Astle. How does the gangster chains play into effect in your slalom skiing? Um, pretty aerodynamic. shattered and I know everyone around me was too and can't even possibly imagine what it was like for the families. Losing Bryce and Ronnie was a huge hit to the U.S. team. They're the next generation. These two guys were the best in their disciplines. Uh, Bryce in slalom, Ronnie in downhill and super G. They were the next up-and-comers. They could be the guys competing in the Olympics. This is the famous smile because uh, he had just won U.S. Nationals, juniors. He always had my back and it just, it makes you appreciate it more now that he's not here, you know? Bryce was such an important part of my life and after we lost him, it was a pretty easy decision for my wife and I to name our son Bryce. He lived for every moment. He would get done training and he would go out and he would ski. And this is a card that we made up at the time we lost the boys and it has Bryce so amazing on skis and Ronnie in his element going 70 miles an hour through the air. He was kind, and he was grounded. Ronnie, he was always just a jokester. He wasn't afraid of the, the World Cup vet. He would just always speak his mind to me, and I love that about him, you know? Watching him laughing just made me think, wow, I have the best brother ever. He was a good teammate, he was a good friend, a good son, and we had a lot of fun together. January 1st, 2015, I took Bryce to the airport. He was going to hook up with uh, Ronnie Burlack and the rest of the U.S. ski team. They were going to Europe to uh, train for uh, Europa Cup. We got to Solden, and it had just snowed a lot. Obviously, there's no training because there's so much snow. So we sent everyone out to go ski around and have some fun. Just seeing snow that's untouched and being like, this is a dream come true. We're having an amazing time. 
We could see the bottom of the valley, we could see the road, so we started skiing. I just remember skiing across this face and all of a sudden I just heard cracking. Everything underneath me started moving. I saw Bryce and I heard him say, oh shit. I never even saw Ronnie. We stood there and we watched them go. Nothing made any sense. And it just instinct took over and there were people who had skied down right before us who saw everything and pulled out their transceivers. They're wearing beacons. No, no beacons. No, no, beacon. no, no avalanche equipment. I need shovels, I need shovels. That was when I realized how stupid we were being. Okay, does anybody have a probe? We're at the bottom of Solden 1. We need a helicopter, two more patrollers, hasty team, and AED. Probably took 15 minutes for helicopters to come in. I was like pretty aware that it had been too long. The first thing that appeared was Bryce's boots sticking up out of the snow. He was upside down. His boot was six feet from the surface. Came across Ronnie a few minutes later. Ronnie, we got him. Did you get him out of the hole? That was an image that I'll never forget. The concept of riding up a lift, skiing on a trail, and we're in danger, that did not exist in any of our heads. The coaches and the boys did not receive any orientation or any training regarding the dangers of skiing in Europe versus skiing in North America. None of the young men in that group knew the difference between on and off piste. Off-piste in the United States is defined as out of bounds, going through the gate, going under the rope. That's not what the rules are in Europe. When you are off the groomer, you are off-piste. In Solden, the day before the avalanche that killed Bryce and Ronnie, there had been heavy snowfall and strong winds. What that did was, is it put a lot of weight on top of the snowpack, which was fragile. Once these skiers got onto that slope, it couldn't support the additional weight. That weak layer fractured over a wide area, and that slab came crashing down. It produced debris that weighed almost seven million pounds, the same as almost 10 747s. It takes all of 20 minutes to, to learn and to be educated. You want to make sure you're prepared. There are five points that are always really good to remember. You want to get the gear, get the training, get the forecast, get the picture, and get out of harm's way. First, you need the gear. Going in the backcountry, you need a beacon, a probe, and a shovel. And unfortunately, that day in Solon, the boys did not have that. Ronnie! I would have done anything for rescue gear, especially a shovel. You can always increase your chances of being surgible if you're unlucky enough to be caught in an avalanche by having reco reflectors in your equipment and clothing. Getting the gear is useless if you don't know how to use it. You've got to get the training. Take an avalanche class. If we would have taken just one class, we would have known not to ski down that terrain in the first place. One key thing you're going to learn in every avalanche class is that you have to check the forecast every time you ride. None of us checked the forecast that morning. It would have taken just two minutes on the gondola ride, and none of this would have happened. So when you're out on the snow, you got to get the picture. And what does that mean? That means pay attention. Are you seeing recent avalanches? That's by far the most important clue. That's like Mother Nature screaming in your ear. If 
we had known. It wasn't controlled. We 100% would not have been there. Finally, get out of harm's way. What that means is only one person is riding the slope at a time. We were breaking one of the simplest rules. In some ways, it's a miracle that all six of us didn't die. Once you get to the bottom, you need to get out of the way. That way, if somebody else in your group triggers an avalanche, you won't be caught. These five simple steps everyone should know about and everybody should be trained in. Coaches, parents, athletes, administrators of the program. Everything that we did could have easily been prevented. I wish I could say that I couldn't have done anything to save their lives. That's just not true. Anytime you have a major accident like this, it causes a ton of introspective thought. We realized that we really needed to look at it from the top down, bottom up. How can we make sure everybody's more educated to avert and reduce the chance of anything like this ever happening again? That's why we at Brass are creating avalanche education specifically for coaches and athletes. We're also creating snow safety policies to be followed by ski racing groups. Ski racing is definitely a dangerous sport, but where we're going down is a really highly regulated area. You have all the fencing, you have the snow prep, you have all these things that are out there to keep you safe. You get out there in the backcountry, there's, there's none of those luxuries. For the people who assume that just because they know how to ski terrain or they know how to rip down a mountain because they ski downhill, it's, it's a very different beast. Don't let this happen to you and your family. Get educated, get out there, so we can keep skiing for Bryce and Ronnie, so their legacies live on. Well, uh, powerful video. Uh, so once again, uh, thanks, uh, thanks for taking the time out of your evening tonight. Um, so let's, let's explore uh, some of the topics that were introduced uh, in that video. Uh, so here on the screen is, uh, I think, a good overview of who's actually getting caught in avalanches uh, and where. Um, on the left-hand side, there's a, a, a graph of uh, avalanche uh, fatalities, their data from fatalities, uh, broken down by state. Uh, Colorado sees the largest uh, distribution of uh, avalanche fatalities, followed by Alaska and, and, and Montana and Washington, uh, and then on down the line. Uh, interesting fact here is that about, you know, around 90% of uh, avalanche accidents uh, are, are coming, are triggered or started by someone in the group, uh, which is kind of a, a daunting uh, stat there that, yeah, 90% of avalanches, you, you know, somebody in the group or, or likely the person caught and, and killed is actually the one that's triggering it. Uh, but I actually think you can, you can turn that on its head and, uh, and, and frame that in the positive, uh, which is, is to say that, um, you, the backcountry traveler, is actually in control of your own risk, uh, meaning that avalanches don't just come out of nowhere or happen for no reason. There's uh, snowpack structure, weather, and so forth uh, all, all involved. And so uh, you can do something about it, and that's part of what we're going to learn about tonight. So uh, let's uh, switch gears and just take a quick uh, survey using that Mentimeter app. Uh, and as mentioned, the app code, the code to enter is 6211020. And so the pop quiz here is how do avalanches form? And you'll see there's three answers there. Uh, the first one is snow gets too deep and breaks. Second option is a weak layer of snow gets buried under more snow and eventually fails. And your third option is a snowball begins rolling downhill and picks up momentum. 
I'll give you just a sec here to get that app rolling and choose your best answer. I see that answers are starting to come in. So thanks for participating in that. So yeah, the, the, the actual correct answer is a weak layer of snow gets buried under more snow and it eventually fails. Uh, Mark Staples in the video that you just saw kind of described that and described the that uh, that layering and structure that, that led to the accident in the video. So, um, you know, the, the, the point is that the snow under us builds up in uh, layers and layering within the snowpack uh, is the root of avalanches and different uh, weather events uh, and are, are what drive the process uh, within the snowpack, within that layering. And so we're going to learn a little bit here about layering. So what is an avalanche? There's a lot of different kinds of avalanches, but the kind that causes the most trouble are what we call dry slab avalanches. A slab avalanche is like a monster in a horror film lies underneath the perfect facade in this enticing powder that's just waiting for a trigger to come along like you to collapse that weak layer and then that collapse just goes outwards in all directions the slope just shadows like a pane of glass there's no escape it rockets down the hill bounces you off trees and rocks on the way down tumbles you over a cliff i mean does any of that sound dangerous to you avalanches are very violent events one out of four people are killed by the trauma of hitting trees and rocks on the way down. And after they tumble you to the bottom, then the avalanche debris instantly sets up like concrete. You can't just pop off out of this. Somebody else has to get you out of the snow. Really fun day. It was beautiful powder snow, blue skies, sunshine, just pow shots, nothing extreme. We were trying to get gnarly or anything. Came around the corner, dropped in. It was great. And then saw cracks shoot out all around me. I did see like the sky for a moment and then just a whole wave of snow went over my face. And I had like a moment of, ah, oh, maybe I can just punch through to the top. And as soon as I tried to move it all, I realized that I couldn't even bend a finger. Yeah, so the good points there. Um, you know, it's just important to remember that all, all avalanches aren't created equal um, and all storms are different. Uh, and it's those different storms and the different uh, weather that's actually driving uh, all of that layering. And some layers are weak and some layers are strong. Uh, and what's interesting though, is that uh, it's hard to tell what, the, what those layers look like and how they're interacting with one another uh, just by being on the snow and riding through it. So uh, a little later, we're gonna talk about how you actually uh, can get a leg up on identifying what's going on in the snowpack. So yeah, there, there's, as mentioned, there are some layers that are strong and some layers that are weak. Uh, and of course, it's when you have weak layers inside of that snowpack that avalanches, um, you have a greater potential uh, to experience avalanches. Uh, and digging, of course, in the snow allows us to uh, do some of our own investigation. Uh, but the cool thing is there's a lot of professionals out there doing the digging for you. So. Uh, take a look at this video and check out these th this layering. You can see here that's really strong layering up on top. And down here we've got this, uh, you know, sugary snow. Uh, it's called depth uh, And you can just uh, you can just visualize like um, even conceptually like, you know, the foundation of your house or the building that you're in. Uh, you know, you want that you want that house built on something pretty, pretty solid. Uh, and if it's not sitting on something solid, you can imagine it's just kind of teetering there and, um, you know, just waiting and waiting for the right moment uh, or maybe the right trigger. And, and of course, uh, with a snowpack structure like this, that trigger could be you, the uh, backcountry traveler. So let's shift gears for just a sec. And, and, and I want to talk about terrain. So the snowpack is very dynamic. And the uh, snow is, as mentioned, is, is driven, you know, the snowpack is, is driven by the weather, the weather that laid it down uh, and the subsequent weather, you know, maybe it's been very cold and clear lately. Well, that actually does have an effect on the snowpack. 
Uh, and it, it takes a lot of expertise to really understand what's going on in the snowpack. Um, but one of, the, one of the key tips to remember when you're moving around in the backcountry is that terrain is key. And it's very simply put, uh, you can't get caught in an avalanche if you're not in avalanche terrain. So understanding terrain is the key to you staying safe and staying out of avalanches. Um, well, so, you know, let's take a look at this, at this picture here and, and, and just notice that there's some uh, slope angle uh, guides there. So at the top, you see that number 33. Imagine if you, uh, you're standing up on top of that uh, mountain and you wanna pick a line to ride down. So just pick a line and then, uh, then remember that slope angle. And we're gonna talk about that in a sec. Which mainly means judging slope steepness. Almost all avalanches occur on slopes steeper than 30 degrees, but you know what? When the snow is sketchy, we can still have lots of fun playing on mellower terrain. We just want to make sure we're not on, underneath, or even connected to steeper slopes. The bottom line is the only time we should even consider getting into steep terrain is when we have safe avalanche conditions. Some slopes are going to produce much worse outcomes should they avalanche than other slopes. For example, if you're above a bunch of trees, rocks, cliffs, or you're going to get washed into a lake or a gully, the outcome of getting caught in an avalanche like that is much worse than if you're in some big wide open meadow. Awesome. So, uh, you know, slope angle or steepness is actually one of the, the core components of evaluating terrain. And this is a great little protractor here uh, to kind of bake into your memory. Um, you know, if you look there in the, in the green section, that's, that, that's terrain that's below 30 degrees. Um, and that's oftentimes not steep enough uh, in all but the most uh, severe un, in, instable snow. It's really rare to get avalanches starting uh, at that slope angle. And if you take a look at the yellow there, that greater than 45 degrees, it's not super common to have avalanches or significant avalanches initiating above that 45 degree mark, uh, just simply because it, you know, snow doesn't accumulate uh, as much as it does uh, slightly below that angle. Uh, and that's the sweet spot there, kind of the Goldilocks um, uh, section, that 30 to 45 degrees. And that's where the vast majority of avalanches are going to occur. And if you think back to that line that you would like to have skied off of the uh, off the summit back a couple of slides ago, think back to what that number number was, uh, and how does that line up in this protractor? Uh, it's also really important, uh, you know, to note that uh, about 30 degrees is, you know, it depends on what ski area you're you're uh, you're hanging out in, but 30 degrees is is approximately a blue slope, and I, I would venture to say that most of us. Uh, listing in tonight and participating, uh, you're probably skiing uh, blue slopes and many more slopes uh, above that in, in, in difficulty. So when you think of riding in the backcountry, we're oftentimes think of riding at, at uh, slopes greater than 30 degrees. So you're usually being, you're usually gravitating towards avalanche terrain when you're getting after it. So we've got a Mentimeter uh, question here. So take a look at this uh, piece of terrain kind of in the foreground here in this slide. The question is, where is there non-avalanche terrain? If you were in the foreground on that, on that mountain there, where is there non-avalanche terrain? So you've got three answers. It's all avalanche terrain at the top of the slope or, or the summit. And the third answer is that there is no avalanche terrain in this photo. All right, so take a look at, I think we're getting answers to come in here. So let me show you something here that might help you out. 
So that is terrain. That's what we would call the starting zone. That's, that's the chunk of terrain in which avalanches usually begin. Uh, that particular piece of uh, terrain is about 39 degrees, so well in the wheelhouse uh, of that red zone that you saw in the protractor. And then the rest of the terrain is connected. So remember, it doesn't have to be 30 degrees and above to be avalanche terrain. That's just where they need to start. You may be in lower angle terrain, but connected to steeper terrain. So it's important to be paying attention, not only to what you're standing on in that moment or, or riding down in the moment, but what's connected to it. Is there some avalanche terrain connected to the terrain that you're in? Uh, but the correct answer is that uh, the top of the uh, summit and the ridge line isn't avalanche terrain. There's nothing above you on the summit. Uh, there's nothing above you on the ridge that's steeper than 30 degrees. So you are not in avalanche terrain. And one of the core tenets of moving around in the backcountry is really being solid at identifying what's avalanche terrain and what's not. So there's a few other things. I mentioned that slope angle is kind of one of the core things to look for, but it's not the only thing to look for. And, and Brian had mentioned in one of those videos uh, before that there's some other things in the terrain that you need to be paying attention to. We oftentimes refer to them as terrain traps and terrain traps simply put, are things in the terrain that could increase, increase the consequence if you were to get caught in an avalanche. And there's four really solid examples here. You've got gullies and sharp transitions. You imagine if you, that's not a big slope you're looking at in that, in that upper left-hand corner there, but if you got caught in an avalanche, you'd go down into the gully and all that snow would pile right up on top of you. That could be pretty bad. You could end up in a, in a really deep avalanche that would be hard for your partners to dig out. Trees, that's another one. That's a big one where I live around in Washington. Uh, trees are really hard. You know, the, the, an old avalanche instructor once told me, like, if you don't think trees are a problem in an avalanche, just get on your bike, ride it down a hill, get going 40 miles an hour and steer it right into a big tree. And that's basically the effect when you're caught in an avalanche. Uh, speeds are pretty high and bouncing off trees is, is it can be uh, lethal. Rocks and cliffs, even small avalanches in that, in that sort of terrain can be uh, very consequential. Uh, you trigger a small avalanche and get carried over a cliff, that's bad news. And then of course, really large paths, like uh, any sort of like big mountain, large slopes, uh, you know, if you were to get caught, you might actually go for a really long ride and just all of that uh, tumbling can cause a real, um, you know, can uh, add a lot of trauma. Here's a little video from the free ride tour. So I imagine all of us have seen a sign like this. Um, some might be a little more verbose, some might be a little more concise, uh, but these signs are all over the place. They're all over the place in the US, they're all over the place in Europe. Uh, the, big, the big thing to remember with any sort of sign uh, that's uh, delineating you leaving a ski resort is that it's time to switch the goggles you're looking, you're looking through because as soon as you leave the, um, the resort, uh, you're no longer, you're assuming more risk. You then become your ultimate uh, 
uh, control of risk. You don't have a whole uh, team of uh, snow safety uh, personnel, uh, groomers and so forth controlling the slope. Uh, so all of a sudden you're assuming a lot more risk when you go, don't go through. And we're gonna talk a sec here, the difference in uh, the US and Europe and what it means uh, to go through a, a boundary or to see a sign that says off P. The difference between riding in a ski resort and riding in the backcountry is really night and day. In a ski resort, we use explosives and terrain closure to minimize the risk of avalanches to our customers. But outside the ski area, once you step just two feet over that rope line, you're in a totally different environment. Anybody that's going into the backcountry or thinking about going off piste at a resort really needs to understand that it's a totally uncontrolled environment. There isn't any ski patrol, uh, they're not bombing or doing any avalanche control. It can be really dangerous. So essentially you need to be, you know, your own avalanche expert. So in nine out of 10 avalanche fatalities, they're triggered by the victim or somebody in the victim's party, which is actually good because it's not like getting struck by lightning. We have a choice. That means if we learn something about avalanches, we can avoid getting caught in avalanches. Yeah, so some really good tips in there. So, you know, like as mentioned, you know, most accidents happen outside, and I should say avalanche accidents happen outside of resort boundaries. Uh, we call that the backcountry. A uh, good important point uh, to remember uh, is that, um, you know, the side country equals the backcountry in, in, in North America. Uh, and just actually really quick before I move on to that, uh, uh, you know, side note is that actually last year we did have four uh, avalanche fatalities occurring inbounds uh, in the U.S. last year at resorts. Um, and so it, it, it's really a, gr a good note to remember that there is a whole team uh, working on your behalf uh, to manage your risk inside of the ski area boundaries. Uh, but we are dealing with uh, a pretty complex phenomena uh, regarding avalanches and mother nature, uh, and they are not taking away all of your risk inside of the boundaries. So if it's a day where it's, you know, snowing really hard, um, you know, you want to be paying attention, you might want to ski a little more conservatively, uh, even in bounds. And definitely for those of you uh, who are who are skiing in bounds, mostly pay attention to the signs and the ropes, those things are there for a reason. And if something's closed or roped off, it may not be uh, safe enough for you to be there and or they may be doing active control, the ski area, the ski patrol may be doing active control or mitigation on that piece of terrain. So really heed those, those ropes and signs advice. And so, yeah, as I kind of alluded to the ski area boundaries in North America, you've got two, two primary uh, delineations inbounds uh, and then the side country and back country really are the same thing for all intents and purposes. Uh, side country at most ski areas is not controlled. Uh, while there may be more traffic in there, while you may see ski tracks, that does not necessarily mean that it's safe. Just because someone else has gone there does not mean it's a good idea for you to go there. Uh, so really back to that, like as soon as you leave the ski area, you've got to have a different set of lenses that you're looking through. And that's one of uh, looking at the snowpack, understanding what's going on having the right gear and approaching terrain in a, in a way that makes sense uh, given the conditions. It takes a, a, lo a level of expertise uh, that doesn't, isn't necessarily associated with how uh, good you are at riding, how, how proficient you are at skiing or snowboarding. As soon as you leave North America, uh, you know, i.e. Europe, um, on-piste and off-piste is the terms that they tend to use. And what's interesting is in, in the North American um, ski area layouts, they tend to be broad swaths of terrain. Whereas in Europe, on-piste literally means uh, on the trail, on a groomed run. Um, as soon as you leave that groomer in many areas, literally the groomer, that chunk of terrain may not, may be unmarked uh, and it likely has no avalanche mitigation, which means you're in the backcountry, even though it, it's, it's touching and adjacent to some of these ski runs that you may ski. 
So it's really important that if you're leaving the ski runs or you see a sign that says off piste, that means that avalanches may, may um, you need to know what you're doing in order to go there and you need to have all the right equipment and so forth. So um, we've got a question here in the Mentimeter. Uh, and the question is, what does off-piste mean in Europe? Powder ungroomed fun, groomed runs, or it's outside the ski run and there's no avalanche mitigation. Looks like the answers are starting to come in. And I think we've probably got that one pretty good. So it is it is outside of the ski run. There's no avalanche mitigation. So off piste means no avalanche mitigation. So there's a, it's pretty complicated to move around in the back country. Um, and there's a lot, there's a lot to it. Um, a bunch of experts got together a few years ago. Um, and we came, we, we came up with this uh, more of a simple way of framing everything that needs to happen in order to safely move around in the backcountry. Uh, and these are the, the five core tenets of backcountry travel. So uh, the first three are ones that happen prior to your day out, prior to you being at the trailhead or the ski area. Uh, so get the gear, get the training and get the forecast. The next two are ones that are happening during your day. So you're, you're getting the picture and then you're, you're, you're getting out of harm's way. So let's start with the first one, which is get the gear. That's a, I think a, a pretty easy one for all of us to do. I think of it as the low hanging fruit of all of these uh, five. It's pretty easy to go down and get your equipment and always have it on. Uh, so the core pieces of equipment are an avalanche transceiver, an avalanche probe, and an avalanche shovel. And the slide kind of tells you what they're for, they're for using, but a transceiver, I mean, the word comes from uh, transmit and receive. So the idea is it's, it's, a, it's a, a device, an electronic device you're, each person is wearing. Uh, you turn it on send when you head out. So it's sending a signal and it's, they, they, they say, uh, you know, the other thing to think about is they say uh, on at the, uh, you know, um, on at the beginning of the day and, and, and off uh, at the bar. So uh, you, you want to run the thing always and have it transmitting. And then if in the event uh, somebody in your party got caught in an avalanche and you couldn't find them, you would, uh, everybody would turn their beacon or avalanche transceiver to search and uh, search and get close, get a, you know, get into the close proximity of where your partner's buried. You'd then pull out your avalanche probe and the probe allows you to pinpoint exactly uh, where your partner is located. Uh, and then, if, then you'd pull your shovel out and dig. And the, and the probe is as essential as the transceiver as is essential as the shovel. So these three things work uh, in unison. Uh, and quite frankly, you really, each person needs all three of them or it's, it may as well, you may as well leave them at home because uh, you, you need all three. And then it's really important that everyone um, has all three of these items. Seem totally overwhelming. You know, but there is a systematic step-by-step -step process that can keep you alive in avalanche terrain. Just knowing five basic things can prevent most avalanche accidents. Get the gear, get the training, get the forecast, get the picture, and get out of harm's way. Everyone who goes into backcountry avalanche terrain needs basic avalanche rescue gear. You need an avalanche transceiver, a shovel, and a probe. And you need to practice a lot to know how to use all of this gear because your friend only has about 15 minutes to live buried beneath the snow. A lot of people also use an inflatable avalanche airbag backpack that will help them rise to the top of avalanche debris. How well does this avalanche rescue gear actually work? Well, for one out of four people killed in an avalanche, they're gonna die from trauma. They're gonna hit trees or rocks on the way down the slope. So avalanche rescue gear isn't gonna do anything for them. The rest of them die from asphyxia, from breathing their own carbon dioxide underneath the snow. But it doesn't have to be that way. If everyone wore an avalanche airbag backpack, as well as an avalanche transceiver, two out of three people who die from asphyxia would still be alive. The bottom line is avalanche rescue gear will only save about half of us. 
But in order to stack the odds in my favor, I make sure to never go skiing without them. As sledders, we travel in the backcountry a little bit differently than skiers, but I still need to have my avalanche gear attached to my body. Having it attached to my tunnel does me no good. If I get separated from my sled, I get separated from my safety gear. If your buddies that you ride with don't have the training and the equipment, don't let them ride with you. Yeah, so there were some pretty good uh, kernels of information in there, uh, making sure that everybody's got the gear. Uh, but then a really good, really important uh, piece in there was that uh, there's a significant number of people that are killed in avalanches that are killed in trauma. And the avalanche uh, shovel, uh, transceiver, and probe uh, don't really do any good if you're hitting trees and going off cliffs. Um, so the, the real takeaway there is that it's, it's very important to not get caught in an avalanche because they are so powerful and the, the gear is really just there as a backup for when you have made a mistake. Um, so yeah, gear works, but you know, you need to do, you need to practice with it. And I think that was another uh, salient point that one of the, uh, one of the people in that video made is that you need to know how to use your gear. Uh, avalanche rescues are challenging. Uh, you can imagine that if it was your partner uh, buried in the snow, that uh, it's a high stress situation, right? And uh, it's, and time is of the essence, uh, as mentioned, that about two thirds of the people die of asphyxia, uh, which means they're, they're more or less suffocating in the snow. Uh, and imagine how long it takes, you know, how long you can hold your breath for. Um, so you're really shooting for a small window of time in order to get to the get to your partner, locate him with the transceiver, pinpoint him with the probe, and then dig out probably one to 2000 pounds of snow. And ideally, you're wanting to do that well inside of 10 minutes. Uh, and so it's really hard to, um, to, effect, to, to uh, perform an effective rescue if you don't have a solid system. And the only way that you can have a solid system on rescue is by getting the training. So getting formalized mm -hmm. avalanche education on how to use all of that equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, and in addition to that, a, a formal avalanche course uh, that I would say informal, I mean by a field-based course. Uh, we usually refer to them in the in the in North America as a level one class. Uh, that involves also learning about terrain and applying a lot of the um, uh, topics that we're covering tonight, but applying them actually out in the field and getting to practice, uh, you know, with with a mentor or an instructor with you. Uh, because remember, the important piece is not to get caught in an avalanche take an avalanche course, you're basically getting keys to a whole new world. You'll learn about avalanche terrain, snowpack, weather, rescue. Essentially, you're trying to take the guesswork out of travel in avalanche terrain. As a first timer just coming in, it's really important to take the right classes and gain all the knowledge before going out in the backcountry. Getting the training isn't just taking an avalanche class. It's a great start, but really it's about practicing what you've learned. You know, make it a ritual. Make it fun. You know, throw down some lunch money and do some time drills. You know, when it comes down to it, it's about having your friends back and knowing that they have yours. It's not just the skiers that need to get the training because sleds are taking us further into the backcountry. So we really need to bring our avalanche skills up to the level of our rider skills. Next, 
you got to get the forecast. These avalanche forecasters are pros. They're going to tell you everything you need to know. They're going to tell you about the snowpack. They're going to tell you about the weak layers. They're going to tell you where avalanches are going to happen, where you can likely avoid avalanches. All that information is one click away. To get the avalanche forecast, visit avalanche.ca in Canada or avalanche.org in the States. Before I even get on the snow, I check my local avalanche advisory. So take the time, get the forecast. We'll talk about the forecast in just a sec, uh, but just on regarding training, here's a couple of uh, or three great resources uh, to finding a course. Uh, there's the ARI website, ARI.org. Uh, Avalanche.org is another great uh, resource. There's some awesome training tutorials, but uh, and then links to finding uh, courses. And then there's the Know Before You Go uh, website there. Um, those are all three great resources for finding a, uh, a an avalanche course in your area. And likewise, your local avalanche center usually has a list uh, or connections um, for avalanche providers in your area. So when you go into the backcountry, every day that you're going, you want to be checking the forecast and then getting the picture and getting out of harm's way. So let's focus for a sec on the forecast. And I had mentioned earlier that it's complicated what's going on in the snow. Uh, but fortunately for all of us, uh, you know, for, for, I should say for most of us in North America, at least if we're going into uh, most areas, whether it be in Washington or Colorado or Montana, we've got a great resource, which is your local avalanche center. And those are, those are built of teams of professionals uh, who are going out in the snow, getting it weather information, talking to professionals and getting info from the public. And they're putting together an avalanche forecast, which is really your foundation for managing your own risk. And we do so by communicating with a danger scale, which is kind of like the probability of avalanches uh, occurring in the zone in which you're going. It's a five part scale, uh, low to extreme. And a good way to think about it is that uh, this, or I should say a good way to think about these, uh, these ratings is like this. So low doesn't mean no, but it means uh, there's uh, only really small chunks of terrain that you need to avoid or pay attention to. And as you go up in the danger, as you go up moderate, considerable, high and extreme, uh, there's fewer and fewer uh, places that you can go and avoid avalanches. So remember, as that, as that number or that color goes up, that means there's less opportunity uh, or less terrain you can work with uh, to stay out of an avalanche. And what's interesting is that uh, in moderate and considerable, that's uh, pretty close to about 80% of avalanche fatalities occur uh, in those two ratings. And those are uh, right in the middle there. Uh, with high and extreme, it's usually pretty obvious that it's super dangerous out. Uh, and there's also a really good warning system that's kind of connected with the weather service. Um, there, maybe there's even a, a news presentation about how dangerous the avalanches are and people usually get the message. And then of course, when it's low, there's just a lot lower chance of, of people actually encountering avalanches. But in the, in the moderate and the considerable place, especially in considerable, it's actually dangerous conditions, but it's oftentimes not obviously so. So if you see that it's considerable out, uh, even though you don't see signs of avalanche danger, it's really important to have taken an avalanche course out in the field and learn to apply the avalanche forecast. And then just remember, if there's something that you're unsure of, terrain is your friend. Terrain is how you actually control your risk. And the best thing to do is just avoid avalanche terrain. Uh, if there's something in the forecast you don't understand or you think it's... Um, the danger level is too high or there's too much of a risk of encountering an avalanche. So remember, if you can stay out of avalanche train, you can still go out and recreate for that day and avoid avalanches. And the forecast, uh, you know, in addition to the danger rating that they have, we, we can go down into, for, for those who've had an avalanche class, there's a lot of information that you can pull out of a forecast. Uh, we do things called avalanche problems. Uh, and that gets back to that, uh, the layering and the snowpack and that not all avalanches are created equal. There's definitely different types of 
of avalanches or different char characters of avalanches. Uh, some are dry, some are wet, uh, some are loose, and some are big chunks of snow that are moving all at once. So the forecast, uh, for those who have had some training, uh, can tell one a lot about the conditions of the snowpack. And that information uh, can allow you to really dial in where it is that you go in the terrain to stay safe. Let's talk about get the picture here. When you're traveling in the backcountry, you got to get the picture. What's that mean? It means pay attention. Look for recent avalanches. Listen for cracking or whomping that's taking place around you. Look for recent storm snow, wind loaded snow. Look for rapid thawing. If you look for all these things, you're gonna get the picture. You're gonna be a safer backcountry skier. Yeah, that's great. So there's a couple of things to pay attention to uh, while you're out there. Uh, I think this is a trap that a lot of uh, people can get sucked into, myself included back in the day. Uh, and that is, do other tracks uh, mean that the slope is safe? And I think the short answer there is maybe, <laughs> but that is not a reliable thing uh, to look at and determine that it makes sense to ski or ride that slope. Other tracks do not mean that the slope is safe. It just means that those exact people at that time that they rode down that slope didn't trigger an avalanche. That's all it's telling you. And you might be 10 feet over, it might be two hours later, and uh, you may find yourself in an avalanche if that's the only means you're using to determine uh, if the slope is safe. So a couple other things when you're out there um, to try to get the picture is what we call red flags. And they're kind of the uh, obvious clues. And there's kind of uh, five uh, core red flags that you want to look at. And I can't it's, it's amazing the number of uh, avalanche incidents and uh, accident reports that we, we see that uh, somebody in the party that survived uh, had noted that there had been recent avalanches or that they heard avalanches and then they continued on and they, they later then got caught in an avalanche. Uh, you can't have better, uh, a better indication of unstable snow or potentially uh, getting caught in an avalanche than seeing recent avalanches on similar or adjacent terrain to where you want to go. Um, and if you hear avalanches, I mean, they're just huge red flags. If you see avalanches or if you get up and you're, you're wanting to ski a slope like this and you see that, then it probably makes sense to just completely avoid avalanche terrain. They are big red flags. They're super obvious clues that there's instability there. Here's another one here. Um, we call it um, cracking uh, or collapsing. And so we've got a Mentimeter question really quick here. And the question is, uh, what is a womph? What is a womph sound? Um, you've got three options here. You've got it's a weak layer of snow collapsing. It's snow falling off a tree nearby. <laughs> and it's a friend landing a huge air. So I think we've got some answers coming in. And yes, it's, uh, it's the first one. It's a weak layer of snow collapsing. And uh, it's just like it sounds. And it's quite an eerie feeling. And it's uh, the snow that you're standing on. And uh, all of a sudden, the snow that you're on collapses. Uh, you're usually feeling it because it's from your weight or one of your partner's weight. Um, and it's a pretty spooky feeling uh, if you haven't yet experienced it. And what it's indicating is that you've got a weak layer of snow and that you are an effective trigger at getting into that weak layer of snow. Uh, and the, the, usually the reason you don't end up from an avalanche uh, in, that, in that structure is that you're probably not in steep enough terrain at the moment uh, for the given conditions. So it's a really good red flag. If you're experiencing um, cracking in the snowpack as you go across it, uh, or this whomping uh, phenomena, you probably ought to uh, ratchet down um, how aggressive of terrain you're gonna choose to enter for that day because you may just find yourself in an avalanche. You've got a couple of the key ingredients, minus terrain. On this third one here uh, for red flags, we've got recent wind drifted snow. 
uh, snow can, wind does a wonderful job of moving snow around. And it's kind of remarkable how much snow can be moved around in a short period of time, given the right conditions and wind. So when it's blowing and you see drifting snow out there, note that that means uh, that's a red flag. It means depending on where you go, you might encounter avalanches. Rain or new snow. I think uh, someone in one of the videos earlier had mentioned uh, uh, loading of the snowpack and the snowpack doesn't like to respond to sudden changes. Uh, rain and significant new snow are sudden changes. So anytime you're experiencing a, a rain on snow event or a whole bunch of new snow that's fallen, um, maybe it's time to, to throttle it back that day. Evidence of rapid thaw, back to the uh, snowpack doesn't like big changes suddenly. Uh, you know, significant rapid warming uh, can stress out the snowpack and can, um, can produce a lot of avalanches. We see that a lot around here in the Northwest where it's, um, you know, cold and then it gets quite warm pretty quick. So getting out of harm's way, let's talk, let's, let's watch a, a short little video here about how do we stay out of avalanches and, and get out of harm's way. You get out of harm's way in the backcountry by first avoiding suspect slopes and terrain to begin with. We don't want to regroup in avalanche paths and we don't want to stop or regroup in runout zones. Some of my best advice I can give you is when we're out hill climbing and there's a bunch of us, don't go park right at the bottom in the avalanche path. Park on the outside, stay out of harm's way. Just like you ski a slope one person at a time, once you're at the bottom, get out of the way of the avalanche path. Great, there's some good advice there. And so, you know, there's a couple of ways to, um, to get out of harm's way. One, uh, one solution is to try to uh, go one at a time. It, it makes sense that if, uh, you know, if you're going to ride down a chunk of avalanche train or, or tour across it, that uh, you shouldn't be all bunched up. Uh, especially if you think to the think back to the uh, avalanche rescue piece and that uh, the people in your in your group are really your uh, best line of defense at uh, getting out of an avalanche if, if you are to be buried. Uh, and so you want to make sure that those resources are not also buried with you. Uh, so one at a time is an important uh, tool to use. The, the really important point, though, about one at a time is that you don't want to use um, a, a technique like this uh, and, and justify entering a slope that you're really worried about. If you're really worried about the slope or someone in your group's really worried about the slope, then by all means, you should not be entering that slope. Uh, just because you're spacing out doesn't mean that that makes, that that's actually um, a good idea. A couple other things to remember is, is have a communication plan. Uh, we know from people who get caught in avalanches that uh, they weren't talking very well. And I don't mean communication plan necessarily if you uh, were to be caught in an avalanche, though that is also something to discuss. But, but really, it's a communication plan at the beginning of the day, like how are we going to talk? Are we going to make sure that we're stopping in certain spots and having, a, having an, an open dialogue that's inclusive uh, at making a decision about whether or not we keep going or choosing where we go. So making sure that there's intentionality with communication, that, that we know can really help, uh, help you manage your risk better, or I should say your group. Uh, and then, of course, keeping your eyes on your partner. You need to stay together. While it's important to, say, spread out uh, riding a slope, uh, you also don't want to just abandon your partners, thinking back, of course, to uh, that you're going to need them if, if you did make a mistake and got buried. You want, to, you want to make sure that you know where your partners are at all times and that you have your eyes on them. Uh, and then, of course, stopping out of the avalanche path, uh, as mentioned uh, by one of the snowmobilers in that video, is that you, you, know, you don't want to just group uh, in bad spots where an avalanche may swing down and get you. So here's uh, one of our last millimeter questions here. Um, and it's really what's wrong with this photo here of all these uh, skiers riding down. Uh, they didn't spoon their tracks. I, I, a few of my heli guide friends might say that's actually the, the big piece. Um, 
the skiers have got, not gotten the forecast. They didn't check the forecast that day. And that they're all waiting in the slide path. And I think it's a pretty obvious one to most of us. Looks like most people are getting it right. Uh, it's that the group is all waiting in the slide path. So thinking about that getting out of harm's way. So you're kind of want to, you want to be uh, using terrain in your favor to manage your risk. And this team here is not doing that very well. It looks like they've taken that technique of, of skiing at one at a time. You can see only one person's actively riding down that slope. Uh, however, the three that went first are waiting right at the bottom. So if that fourth person were to trigger an avalanche, you can just uh, quickly see where it's going to end up. And maybe those people have their packs off and they're eating a sandwich or they're adjusting their boots. They might not be able to get out of the way. So there's a better way to, to do that if you choose to ride that slope that day. And that would be to wait, uh, not at the very bottom of it, regroup in another spot. And that oftentimes takes good communication to be able to see that in the slope and then have a plan. So there's a couple other things to we want to cover here before we wrap up and, and switch over to questions. Uh, one of them is human factors. So many of us have, have heard the term human factors, I'm sure. Um, and I think the, the important piece here is that human factors uh, are really just um, psych psychological things happening oftentimes at the, at the subconscious. Uh, there might be some uh, desires and biases that we have or we possess. Um, and we all act a little bit differently. But the, but the core tenet with all of us is that we're all subject to human factors. We can't take the human out of human factors. We're all human. And so it's important to... Um, uh, to, to pay attention uh, to how you're feeling that day, how your partners are feeling. Uh, and there's a lot to go on. We could, we could do an entire avalanche program, a multi-day avalanche program around human factors and, and psychology and decision-making. It's a, it's a complex uh, topic. I will say that we, we do believe that, that um, kind of the human dynamic is at the root of, of pretty much all, nearly all avalanche uh, fatalities. So I think it's, I'll, I'll say this, that it's important to, uh, to, to get some further education if you're interested in, in moving around in the back country. And it's pretty complicated and, and get to know yourself, get to know your partners and your best uh, human factor mitigation tool is solid communication with your partners. Another other thing that we wanted to mention is just the, the concept of uh, social pressure. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, dynamics or heuristics at, at play. Um, you know, I think scarcity, as it mentions here in this slide, scarcity of untracked snow, uh, that's a huge one. I think we're going to see that one play out a lot this year as, as the uh, many areas are already experiencing um, very high use and demand, uh, I would say record use and demand, uh, you know, COVID driven dynamics that we haven't seen before. We saw that this summer with hiking and mountain biking and boating and you name it, things outside. Uh, there's a lot more people out there. People are being outside is one way you can manage your COVID risk, so to speak. So we're going to see a lot more people recreating. Uh, that's going to drive scarcity. I think it's a, it's, it's one to really be paying attention to this year. Um, you know, if you show up at a parking lot and it's completely full and it's 7 a.m. already, uh, what's that doing to your subconscious? Uh, how's that affecting your plan? And are you really teed up to make good decisions as a group when you're already kind of um, anxious about all the people out there? So Untrack Snow is a big one. Uh, there's a few others here, just des desire to fit in in your group. I mean, that's a, that's a key one. Like everybody wants to be, uh, you know, uh, valued and seen. And uh, so the desire to fit in, sometimes we do weird things to fit in, pay attention to that. Uh, and then of course, there's this, this idea of like resisting desires and honoring safety. Uh, and, and back to communication can really, can really help manage that. And also structures can help manage that, like honoring safety, uh, you know, having a, 
a talk at the at the at the top of the day at the trailhead that every got everyone's got their uh, avalanche transceiver and their shovel and their probe and actually doing a transceiver check before you leave. There's a structure there. That's one of the things you would learn in a field based avalanche class. And then commitment, uh, commitment to being out that day, uh, commitment to, you know, I just did this trip, I spent a bunch of money, this is my one day out, uh, or this is my this is my weekend day, I'm committed to, to getting that peak, it's on my, it's on my bucket list, those sorts of things uh, can oftentimes put us in places where we're making pretty bad decisions. Uh, because realistically, like, um, you know, there's a right time and a wrong time to be in the mountains or to be on a particular slope. Sometimes it's fine to ski a 50 degree slope above a cliff and other times it's a really terrible idea to ski a 30 degree slope. So it's really about right time, right place. And uh, commitment pressures can drive uh, terrible decision making there. So really it comes down to communication and knowing yourself and uh, getting some education that really helps uh, set you up for um, for staying out of avalanches. And then just in that five point, point summary, I think it's important just to remember that, uh, you know, you want to get the forecast, you want to get the gear, you want to get the training, uh, you want to get the picture, and then uh, remember to, to uh, deploy techniques to stay out of harm's way. We want you to realize that avalanches are dangerous, but you can avoid getting caught in them. First, get the gear but then you've got to get the training before ever going into the backcountry. Next, always check your local avalanche forecast so you can anticipate the given avalanche conditions for the day. You can get the picture by looking for the obvious signs of instability. Yeah, and by obvious signs, I think he's, he's specifically referring to those uh, five red flags to pay attention to. So yeah, I'd like to once again, uh, thank our sponsors. I'd like to thank you all uh, for taking the time. Um, I'd like to thank Cindy and the Brass Foundation and Tom for organizing all this. And uh, yeah, I think we've got some time for questions here. Uh, you can go ahead and feel free to uh, <laughs> to use either the Q and A or the chat. Um, yeah, I've got one from Olivia West here asking, how can you avoid avalanches when in the resort? That's a great question. It's, it's somewhat hard to answer, but the first and foremost thing you can do uh, is to make sure you're only skiing and riding in opened terrain. Number one thing right there. Um, we, we've, there have definitely been a collection of avalanches in past years uh, where people had cut under ropes uh, and triggered an avalanche um, in a closed area. So first and foremost, follow the guidance from the ski area and the snow safety and ski patrol people. That's the number one thing you can be doing. Um, outside of that, um, and then not, not ducking ropes, so not breaking the rules, because oftentimes those, uh, those rope lines and whatnot are there specifically uh, to protect you and others. Uh, and then outside of that, uh, you know, I think applying some of those uh, red flags to your inbound stay. You know, if you're seeing active avalanches, if you show up and you hear that they're doing a lot of blasting and they got 30 inches overnight and it's, you know, you've got powder fever and all of those things, um, you know, it makes sense to, um, to maybe take it down a notch and ease into the opened terrain. Uh, and then of course, skiing with a partner. Uh, it's, it's also not uncommon these days that uh, people are wearing avalanche safety gear on um, uh, inbounds uh, on days in which it's, um, it's snowing heavily. Uh, so, you know, staying with a partner, communicating with your partner, paying attention, um, choosing terrain properly, watching out, you know, another one's watching out for those terrain traps. Like even, you know, um, inside of a ski area, there's a lot of, um, you know, complex terrain, undulating uh, terrain that uh, 
you know, even a small avalanche just from the, you know, surface few inches of snow may actually put you in a really bad place. Uh, and, you know, ski areas can't control every single piece. So I think take a lot of the, the you know, rewatch the video tonight, uh, take a lot of that advice and apply it to those days when it's really nuking and then listen to what the ski area people are telling you. That's, that's one of the big ones. Phil Brown's got a question in the Q&A here is how useful is digging pits and do pits tell you much about the overall avalanche risk and that is a great uh, question Phil. Pits are very useful in certain situations and they require a fair amount of training and the, the act of actually digging a pit and performing some sort of snowpack test is not all of that is not all that difficult to do. Uh, but determining uh, what to do with that information is pretty dang challenging. Uh, and then, of course, there's the, the challenge that uh, you can imagine terrains pretty, um, you know, complicated and, and undulating and everything that like if you dig a pit in one section of the snowpack, it's, it's really just a representation of what you're looking at there. And it may be different 10 feet over or 50 feet over or on the other side of the valley. So um, it takes a fair amount of expertise to get much out of digging pits, looking at snowpack structure, doing snowpack tests. It's best less left to experts. Uh, I can definitely tell you that you should not base um, you should not justify entering a slope based on absence of instability in a snow pit, i.e. the only direct action you should take from digging a snow pit would be a no-go. So if you were only going to have a data point from your pit, um, you dig a pit and you don't see any sign of instability, that in and of itself does not say you're good to go. You may have other information about your overall knowledge of the snowpack, what you've been seeing that day and your own expertise to say, okay, with this absence of, of instability, now I think it's okay to go. But if, if you just showed up without any prior information and dug a pit, that's not a, that does not lend itself to making a go decision. If you saw instability, that may in and of itself be enough information to not go. Uh, and then I just recommend really using the avalanche forecasts in your local area. We are digging a lot of pits and multiple pits and lots of other information put together by experts that do this for a living. That's where more digging pits is really advantageous. So making sure you're checking the forecast. Uh, that's great. Um, I'm just kind of reading some of the questions here. I see a question here from Phil Brown. In general, how does the difference between snow in the east and west affect avalanche risk compare, say, the western mountains of the Chick Chocks? Uh, oh, I see east and west of the country, I think. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, probably the best way to think about it is um, avalanches can occur in all mountains. <laughs> avalanches can occur when you have a really thick snowpack, when you have a really thin snowpack. Uh, the important piece, uh, at least regarding avalanches, is that you're paying attention to the area that you're going to and you're, you're generally tracking it. Uh, it's, it's, you know, I, I think rules of thumb are just that, and I think they can lead us in actually to bad decisions to say that, oh yeah, we don't see, we don't see that many avalanches in the Chick Chocks. It's not Colorado, so therefore it's okay. So, I'm actually not a huge fan of, of having uh, rules of thumb, at least with like mountain ranges and, and characteristics, because it's back to that, you know, right time, you know, uh, wrong place kind of a thing. So I think it's more important to understand the snow that you're going into and the seasonal snowpack and how it, how it, how it interplays. Cause some years we can have, you know, you can think of like some years you have a big, big snowpack, some years you have no snow. So think about it in that context. That's a good question, Phil. Thanks. Uh, Brandy's asking, should you have an aval avalanche safety gear in bounds at ski resorts and can happen and can avalanches happen uh, in the trees in bounds? Uh, first point, I think I kind of started to address avalanche safety gear in bounds at ski resorts. I think we're seeing a trend where more and more people are wearing uh, transceiver uh, probe and shovel in bounds. Um, 
you know, especially on days where it's really storming and, and maybe you hear the ski, uh, ski patrol doing um, control work, that might be a, a good uh, barometer for whether or not you want to grab that gear if there's a lot of new snow overnight. I don't think it's required to have that gear inbounds. We are seeing a trend of people uh, having it. Um, if you are skiing avalanche terrain, um, steep terrain inbounds, and there's a lot of new snow or there's a lot of, you know, there's a, a higher risk of avalanches, obviously having that equipment on you and having your partners have that equipment is really helpful if you were to get caught in an avalanche um, based on the, on the, on the, on the time frame in order to rescue people. Uh, but I don't think it's, I, I wouldn't require it, nor would I say it's mandatory. And then can avalanches happen in the trees in bounds? Um, you know, if you can ski through the trees really, you know, quite quickly, or if there's open sections in the trees and it's obviously steep enough, it's avalanche terrain that is, um, yeah, of course you can have avalanches in there. And I, I think, you know, back to the ski area is doing a really good job managing your risk. If, you know, I think it's, it's unlikely that you're gonna encounter avalanches uh, in a ski area that's been, you know, in an, an open terrain, but, um, but I guess there's a chance just like there would be in other chunks of terrain. So, I mean, I think the metric for, for um, trees and avalanches is if it's, if they're open, you know, gladed trees, if they've got little open sections within there, uh, if you can, you know, ski through them pretty quick, then, then yeah, that there's a potential that you can, uh, you can get avalanches in there for sure. Uh, let's see, I'm just kind of reading through. Uh, where can I, Matt's asking, where can I find avalanche training in the Midwest for my racers who travel to Colorado and Europe? That's a great question, Matt. Um, you know, probably the best place to go would be avalanche.org and um, the uh, airy a i a r e dot org website uh both those do a great job they're they're, they're um kind of clearing houses for um avalanche education uh across the across the continent um and i think you know there's a, a silver lining with covid right now is that uh everyone that i know of including you know this program and the programs that we're running at the Northwest Avalanche Center, we've, we've moved everything online. Uh, so at least for, for some of these like, uh, you know, shorter format primers, like tonight, there's a lot more opportunity now to get pretty good, pretty good training uh, in your own home. Uh, we're even running a, a collection of workshops that are more advanced where we're taking a specific uh, narrower topic and exploring it. I've, I'm actually going to switch over and do a uh, presentation more to advanced uh, travelers here in about 20 minutes. So uh, we're doing a lot of things online. Um, as for field-based programs, I think I'd, I'd, I'd reference uh, ARI and avalanche.org. Um, there's still a lot of, I, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities this year for field programming. I will say to everyone, if you haven't already signed up for a field-based program, um, go to those websites, find a course that works for you in your area or, or where you might be traveling and take the course if you wanna take a field-based class uh, because we're seeing um, record demand. And in, in the Northwest here, if you haven't already signed up for an avalanche class, you're probably not gonna get one until March, so. Uh, Brian Rice is asking, are all beacons compatible? Uh, if you're buying a beacon in the last, you know, if you've got a beacon in the last 10 or so years, 15 years, then yes, they're all compatible uh, internationally. They're all on a um, 457 kilohertz frequency. So yeah, they're all interchangeable. Uh, and then I think the trick is just, you know, picking one that has features that you like uh, and then the, the big, uh, the big pro tip is make sure you know how to work those features, you know how to wear the beacon, uh, you have extra batteries, and then you train a bunch with it and make sure you're super familiar with whatever beacon you choose. 
Uh, but yeah, they're all compatible with one another because they're all on the same frequency. So I think we're pretty much out of time. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks everyone uh, for attending and uh, great questions from all of you. Um, you know, I, I really uh, encourage you to get further information. Uh, feel free to reach out to me directly or through the Brass Foundation. I can be found at the Northwest Avalanche Center. Uh, pretty easy to Google. My email's up there. Uh, so yeah, if there's any anything uh, you, you feel like reaching out to uh, on that, feel free. And uh, thanks for uh, thanks for joining. And uh, here's to a safe season and uh, good night. Thanks so much, Scott. It's been wonderful. We really appreciate all your expertise. And I, I just love some of the illusions, the, the phrases he uses. You got to put new goggles on because you're in a different terrain. You're in, <laughs> in avalanche terrain. So put your new goggles on. <laughs> it's great. So yeah. thanks so much, everybody, for joining tonight. Us Burlax and Astles want a very, in a heartfelt way, not for anybody to experience what we have. And you, you're doing your part by starting your road on, on Avalanche Education now. I'd like to thank some of our sponsors, especially uh, World Cup Supply has been so generous, Backcountry Access, Blizz Tech, RECO, Utah Avalanche Center, and the US, US Ski and Snowboard. Thank you all for your support, all you organizations, and thank you for coming. Good night.